jumbi, cokehead, druggy, junkie, crackhead. These are all words we use in St. Lucia to describe drug addicts. Interestingly, these phrases are most associated with crack cocaine users. These are the ones who would do almost anything for their next high. Cravings for a higher heights eventually leads to prison. With no treatment options behind bars, the vicious cycle continues after the jumbie is released from prison. Re-entry into the penitentiary system is almost certain, a pattern which is called recidivism. This plagues every developed nation on earth with initiation of innovative ways and means to break this cycle. In beautiful Helen of the West, we sweep this issue under the carpet. We lock our doors and hope that the crackheads never get in. But in this episode of Untold Stories, these drug addicts will be in your living room to tell their story from teenage drug abuse to multiple convictions. The harsh, cold shoulder of St. Lucian society and the pleas for help and acceptance. Crack cocaine is a freebase form of cocaine that can be smoked most times through a pipe. It offers a short but intense high to smokers. The substance affects the brain's chemistry by causing euphoria, supreme confidence, loss of appetite, insomnia, increased energy, a craving for more cocaine, and potential paranoia after use. Cocaine was the driving force behind the majority of drug-related violence throughout the 1980s and 90s in St. Lucia. Names of suspected dealers still send the flavored high in the criminal underworld. In the aftermath of their bloody demise, what's left are thousands of young St. Lucians trapped in an addictive cycle of addiction, crime and incarceration. Other factors fertilize this behavior in children as young as 12. Did you start off with marijuana first? Yeah, I started with that first. How did you get introduced to it? Well, actually the friends that I lied with. I lied with him, started smoking. I saw a little small, he liked it. And I told him, let me take a draw. He said, you won't give it to me. I confessed him to give it to me. I told him, let me taste it. And from there I tasted it, that is it. At 16 years old, you start taking drugs. Yeah. Tell me what happens next. Well, I start doing crime. How many times have you been to prison? 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, year 2000, year 2001, year 2002, year 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Every year I'm in jail. So. I ran and bust a guy's house. Two feet, um, took his stereo sets, and we went view for and soil. We get a bag, jockey bag of weed, a couple of pounds of weed. After that, somebody informed on me, and they said, you come at my home, and beat all the other guys that day, and the me response, because I'm, this is my house, because my family is wealthy, but I took my own road, and then they, they just bring me down. This when I drink alcohol, like I, I'm in charge of the world. I don't give a damn to nobody. I'm just doing, you know, I'm just doing things out of order, you know. Slap fellas, beat fellas. This is the way it is. So. The second time you are arrested, what are you arrested for? I got arrested for stealing. Just going to the supermarket and fool my bag and just walk out. I'm speaking honest. I'm not putting nothing back. And they wait for me next time when I go there. They then set up the cell when I come out of the when I get out of the door. Five securities just stand up in front of the door and I have to fight for all five of them. When I get out, a police just pull a gun on me. This is it. Back in jail again. The second time were you convicted? Yeah. How old were you then? I was 23 years. And how long did you serve? I served nine months. For shoplifting and assault? Yeah, but this wrong there. I'm serving five years for shoplifting. Okay. Same thing. You were shoplifting at that point because you had nothing to eat 
or you couldn't give a damn and you couldn't be bothered about working? Well, I actually seen like, like, they got demons behind me, so. Every time I try to cool out, like somebody pricking me because I'm wealthy. I'm like, go go by my sister. She gave me money, she gave me food. It's just that, it's just in my blood. Upon release, on September 17th, 2004, Gasper Williams returned to his familiar pouncing ground. I came out shining. You know, like, come out bright, tougher. Friends start saying, hey, you're out, let's bust the bottles, you know. Hey, look at Johnny Smoke. You know, look a hundred dollars put that in your pocket. And that is it. Back in the same guys, landing with the same guys, doing the same stuff, back in jail again. What would encourage you to break into somebody's house? Do you pick a target or is it because that house is easy to break into that you do? Well, I don't pick targets. When I need money, I get it. It could be any house. Like, you know, I need money. I need to supply myself what I need. So any house, they ain't got no, this one, no, I won't take this one, that one, any one. How did you get rid of the stuff that you stole? Well, actually sold it. You have people who would just buy stuff one from you? One time, I got customers. I got people waiting, like, like I said, there are people waiting, this, waiting for me to come. I have guys even have me living at their home. So when I come with this stuff, just make them hold it. They'll get rid of it and give me the money. Give me drugs, give me alcohol, and that is it. Have you ever broken into somebody's house while they're there? Yeah. Tell me how that worked. <laughs> how did that work? Yeah, run me through that time. How did that work? Yeah. Yeah, pass through the, pass through the balcony, the veranda, climb up. I have my screwdriver open the sliding door, enter in. The person still sleeping. I even go in the bedroom and they're still sleeping. They got a little pot of how much gold, take that. Go down in the living room, take the set, take the, the DVD player, the flat screen and all. I walked out, use the same rope, get a rope in the house and use it down to slide down the, the flat screen. You know what I'm saying? And then slide down back the same way, leave that open. And I just get out of there. And the person had to get up here several times. So you're in jail now the fifth time. Let's just talk about the fifth time. What's the longest before this five years stint? What's the longest that you had been? A year and nine months. A year and nine months. Yeah. That's the longest. What was that for? Wounded. Tell me about that. Well, actually, guys, a fella's give me a slap just so. I'm going to buy my liquor come out of the shop, and this is not a shop. He brushed me out. Did you get it? So when he brushed me out, I now no try, I pulled my cutlass, I gave him one lash in his head. I chop him there, got the slide in the side. Was it a regular thing for you to carry a cutlass with you? Yeah, this is my, this is my weapon. I always do that. I always do that. Always have my cutlass. No knife, just a cutlass. Always, this is like, I can't leave home without it, just like a credit card. Business places? Well, actually, yeah. You've been, you've broken into business places? Yeah, 17,000, 16,000, 15,000. And I just blasted the same night. What do you mean, in goods or in money? Money, cash money. Tell me about that. Well, let's have my crowbar, my pinch bar, and just go inside. First place I jump behind the counter, I get a gun. I get a little box of shoes, a box, a shoe, shoe box, load up with cash. I blast it on the same night. And I always do that, always getting money, always. And I, there is no day, there is no day I ain't got no money. So when I leave this, when I leave prison, I say, come out, there is no day I ain't got no money. Like, I, it's just a gift. I always bust in a place, get a stash of money. Bust in a house, get a stash of money, it's just, I don't know if this running in my blood. Have you ever been violated in prison? No. No. This shit was happening in HMP. Little kids come to school, come to jail, they like to smoke. They love to eat. That happened in HMP. Pull them in the cell and this is it. Knock them out with a stick behind the head and this is it. You? 
No, not me. And the, guy, and the prisoners that there for how much time? I see that in my eyes. But that's not my business. I got to just gotta keep on walking. How do you compare old HMP to Bodley? Well, actually, I yeah, can see when it's safe. Yeah. Because HMP was like everybody for themselves. Who got a cutlass hide there? Who got a knife hide there? They even got a gun there too. Yeah, enough. I see little juveniles come in jail and they blacked out. In jail, they get off. They get raped. You know? Some get beat for their own goods. Your parents come and see you. You come inside your four bags. That's why you jump through the gate. <gasps> All already gone and still beat you again. I see little kids come to school and get, get them in jail and get raped. You know? When they tell them, don't go in under there, they're still going under there. Post slash, blackout, find him naked. What would you say is the most daring thing that you've ever done? The most daring, the most, the, the one that, <laughs> if you sit down there and you start to laugh, you say, boy, that's the one, that was the one. No, well, actually, I'm not bold to say that, you know. Come on, talk no, to me. No, no, I'm speaking your honesty. Tell me. I'm not bold to say that, because <laughs> this is unsolved. Okay, sir, this is unsolved. So, talk that on TV, like, that guy did that. No. All right. <laughs> out, of, <laughs> out of all of those, in reality. <laughs> out of all of those you've been caught, uh, right? tell me um, the most daring. Well, the most daring, you know. Actually, I don't have no daring, you know. no. But I got some devastating things I've done already. Tell me two of them. No, I cannot. Like I said, it's on TV. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm speaking realistic, you know, right. just, just me. Yeah. We are in these prison walls, doing my basics. At Bodley Correctional Facility, inmates are offered a variety of work programs. There is a piggery, a tailor shop, a woodwork shop, the library, and one of the most prized jobs is in the kitchen. Have you ever been in a work program inside a bodily? Actually, I was working in the kitchen. Casper, how come you're not working in the kitchen anymore? Well, the kitchen, they got a lot of things that sometimes you don't want to do it, but the prison, the office is making you do it. And there's where I get caught. They don't want to go and ask for it. They want you to bring it for them. This is where I get caught up. He said he wants milk. So I go and get it for him. A cop, a prison officer. And I bid it for him. I get bus. A bag of milk in my balls. My... And this is where I get caught. Gaspar, you messed up your own self. Yeah. If you are given the opportunity mm -hmm. to work in the prison, not and to work in the kitchen. Yeah. All prisoners want to work in the kitchen. That's where the food is. Yeah. How you mess yourself up? Yeah, because like I told you, an officer will send me. An officer that sent me. We got, we got, okay, let's see, let me tell you. We got, we got, let me see, um, 23 hours out. He locked up. He only got one hour out. So if this officer, this officer working there, he gave me to free up myself because being locked up, again, the smell of the same guy. If a guy fart, you gotta smell his fart. If a guy shit, you gotta smell his shit. And you just locked up in there. So if officer say, well, I know well, I'm, he, he, he like the way I'm moving. He always pulling me out to take a fresh air. So the hell no, I'll do anything for him. And I'm working in the kitchen. So if you tell me you want a portion of milk, there, there. You know, I'm going to do that. Like, I'll tell him like nothing. At the official opening, Dr. Kenny Anthony spoke of it. You can also be assured that every effort will be made to re-educate you and re-equip you with a view to rejecting the life of crime which you initially embarked upon. Sarah Flood echoed it. An institution such as this is built with rehabilitation in mind. Many will come to terms with definable truths. Lives will be changed and transformed for good in this correctional facility. This project is a first of its kind. The Impolette and other dignitaries sat and absorbed the word rehabilitation repeatedly during the ceremony. Ten years after this historic event, Time and rehabilitation seem frozen 
within the confines of this facility. In St. Lucia, it has been suggested for many decades correctional observers did not give priority to the reality that offenders who re-enter society face a varied assortment of daunting challenges that predictably lead to a high recidivism rate. Various researchers also noted that prisoners are stripped of their civil rights and are reluctantly absorbed into communities which lead to their further alienation and isolation. The final factor when looking at causes of recidivism is the difficulty of the released offender when faced with finding a job, renting an apartment, or even getting an education. When you were released from prison that time, you spent a year and nine months. Behind bars, did you learn any trade? Nothing. What was the environment like inside the prison? Nothing. They ain't got nothing. They ain't got no training. For you to get a work, you got to make application. Look, the mother sent me here to prison. And she said, she's going to give me five years. And when I leave this prison, I'm going to have a trade under my hands, right? And like, I'm not saying nothing. They got places where they have woodwork, which I could learn to build a cupboard. The choosing, the picking people. The last night there, I had a vision. I told a guy that myself. I told him I had a vision that I'm going to, I'm going to give Christ my life. Like I feel like the vision, like I'm talking to a person, I say, yes, I'm give up my life, I give my life to Christ. Could I willing to do that? I'm willing to do that straight from my heart. I'm willing to give my life to Christ. But I'm not getting no help. That's the most important thing, so I'm not getting no help. Considering that you've done this so often, how do you expect society to embrace you again, considering that you yourself have not changed? Like I told you, I need counseling, so I know myself. I know I can make a change in my life. And I, have, I feel that in my heart. I can make a change in my life. I can make a change in my life. Like I told you, I need counseling. Now counseling, like, you know, showing me about what the drugs is doing to me. You know, like counseling. But I know I could change, I, have, I could change my life. If somebody were to help you to get into rehab, what guarantee do they have that you will be able to make it through the six-week program? I would surprise them. I'm going to stop all I have. Fifth to God. If I lie, I hate God. I know I can make a change in my life. I know that in my heart. I know that I'm talking to you. And if you do that for me, I'm going to greet you 99 times. Every time I see you in the morning, sir, how you doing? You're going to see a change in me. When we return, a man steals six burgers and finds himself in the slammer. So he shot me for calling me. Leo, where you come from? I said, that's your business. He said, Leo, what you have in the back? I said, whatever I have in the bag, that's mine. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing, from the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products, the dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. They're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. I watched him on the bed, knowing a man who has worked his entire life, can't afford the cost of his surgery or medication. Mom and I must sell barbecue tickets to help save his life. For less than $4 a day, the cost of a packet of gum, my dad could have been airlifted to get treatment. <sighs> Some adults can be so insensitive with their lack of foresight. Now, mom and I either have to watch him wither away or sell a whole lot more barbecue. Why? because one person didn't care enough to plan.
GTM Medical Insurance. Less than $4 a day for the greatest peace of mind anyone could ask for. Call us today, 458-6300. While drug and alcohol abuse manifest themselves in different ways, they share one inevitable threat, the compulsion. To sustain this habit, crack users would do anything from washing cars to pred your last name. That day, I was at my home. Okay? At my land, at my land, just by the road. My house, on top of it. But I didn't have no yam planting by my home. So I see I go up the river. I'm talking honest and truth. I go up the river and I go and dig a portion of yam where my stepfather is in the garden. So I did eat yam. Right? When I go down the river, I saw a partner, me and him, his enemies. So he shot me to call me. Where Leo. you come from? I said, I have your business. He said, Leo, what you have in the bank? I said, whatever I have in the bank, that's mine, but not yours. He said, me, well, if you can tell me where you come from, with it, or where you get it, I'll make for you. 46-year-old Leo St. Marie, originally from Millet, is a textbook example of the vicious cycle of addiction, crime and incarceration. He first wore shiny bracelets in 1985. His story has a familiar beginning. Page 1 is filled with marijuana smoke. Page 2, the word black joint appears. By page 3, he is behind bars. The question is, will Leo's story end with happily ever after? I was frustrated and I get myself, I was smoking marijuana with friends and at the time the friend bring cooking inside the, the marijuana. So when I taste it, I feel it good, it is nice. So from there I just start to take it. I break in the house. When I break the house, I take the, the person at um, set. I sold it for a drugs man. He gave me cooking from the smoke. Me and my partner, the same partner, encouraged me inside of it. Mm -hmm. And I smoke it. You know? So he gave me seven years in prison. I get chopped in the jail, HMP. I get knocked up, knocked out in the jail. You know? You got knocked out? Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, knock, um, give me a, a postal rush in prison. I nearly die. I passed out. I spent how many weeks in hospital? When that yeah. happened? At the, HMP. At HMP? Yeah, in the 70s I was making. In the 70s you were there? Yeah, seven years I was making from HMP. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, were you sexually assaulted at that time? Yeah. When you were assaulted, that was your first time? Yeah. Do you know in the prison who sexually assaulted you? You know the guys? No. 
he was hospitalized because of that. Yeah. It was a terrible experience. Yeah. Why did you go back to jail? I don't know why. I don't know why. But through sometime outside there, that time I didn't have strength for now. You know? I was, I was not taking my life very like, serious at the time. That's why I was falling in jail and go, go outside, get book drugs, to crime, fall in jail, you know? The first time you go? Yeah. The first time you go to jail? Mm -hmm. Was for the same thing? No. For till for thief. You stole something? Yes, yeah, I stole something, yeah. You went to jail? Yeah. The second time? A thief. You stole? Yeah. You went to jail? Yeah. The third time? You stole? Yeah. yeah. You went to jail? Yeah. By the fourth time, isn't your mind saying, whereby is Amun Kudubutsa? Isn't your mind saying that? Yeah, yeah. I, was trying, I was trying my best outside. Yeah. I, could, I could stay outside. Sometimes I stay in Sydney, I could stay about three weeks without smoking no drugs. And, and certain things that come in my mind, when I drink alcohol, I have to go to drugs. I don't want to taste alcohol in my mouth. I have to go for drugs, but I'm not high. That's the reason why I fall in prison. Prison on a bed of roses. The liberty it makes me bad. Old HMP offered Leo anal sex and multiple assaults. March 21st, 1997, Leo had had enough. So when I get frustrated and I see I'm going to die in prison, I escape. I escape from prison for me to save my life. Right? And I go to Buford. So when Bordery, the Bill Bordery and the Bill Bordery finish, they arrest me back. I didn't hide. I just, just put myself kind of way, you know, but I saved my life. The chief student was there, chief um, Griffith was there. They said to the officers, don't shoot me, but I saved my life. The HMP was a kind of way. I couldn't stay there. So when they beat her and they could settle down, they, bring, they arrest me and bring me back in 2005. It has, right now, I've changed my life and I see me. I'm not supposed to do something that's wrong. You know? Right now, I want to do the right thing and I'm going to, I'm going through with God. You know? That's what I did with my life. And How many times have you said that before? Pardon me? How many times have you said that before? I said that how many times? And I didn't hold the promise. Right now. So, Kennedy, if you said that so many times before, yeah. how am I supposed to believe you this time? No. One day, you have to make up your mind. You could but that was the last time, and the last time, and the last yeah. time, and the last time. Yeah. But I promise myself with God that the last time. I willing. I willing. What would it take? What have to happen for you to just stop that life? That life, I make up my mind. I make up my mind. But you've made up your mind several times before. Yeah. But what is different this time? Different. I want, uh, I want, when I get to get a job. A job. But if you myself. get a job and you get the money, mm -hmm. you get the money, you buy the rum, the rum is not good enough. It does not give you the high that you want. You take cocaine. You take the cocaine, yeah. you get the high that you want. You want more cocaine. You go steal stuff to get the cocaine to come to prison for the 11th time. Leo, what would it take for you to stop? I don't want to I don't, I don't want to leave that life here. Yes, but tell me what you will do different. It, I could make a difference. How? With God. When the pendulum of incarceration swings after the break, more stories of rape, violence behind bars, and the hope for a better tomorrow. Jail was a big playground for me at that time. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. 
its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia, and they do it all absolutely free. From marketing concepts, surveys and research, to professionally produced ads for social media and television, and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology, and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could. The Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles, and charting the way for multimedia production here, now and beyond. For 138 years, we've had your back. From home contents to medical, auto to business continuity. GTM Insurance. Sound, solid, and reliable. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing. From the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products. The dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows, doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety, they're your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. The Boys Training Center was created for youth under the age of 16 who have committed crimes that require imprisonment. Many experts argue that the system should focus on rehabilitation of young offenders who are more likely to make a positive change in their life in St. Lucia. Many lawmakers believe that dangerous juvenile offenders were not punished enough at Massad. So, it was common practice to transfer a 15-year-old to a Majesty's hellhole on Bridge Street a recipe which came back to haunt society in the form of 33-year-old Mervyn Joseph. I started using drugs in 14. Yeah, I was using drugs. While I was going to school, I was smoking marijuana because both my parents were marijuana smokers, so I thought it was a good habit. Okay. And how did you get the money to buy marijuana? Well, at first I used to take it home, the butts from the ashtray. And then after I start, when I, when I got expelled from school, I started doing odd jobs, you know, and I used to smoke with my friends, my friends would have. Mervyn Joseph was expelled from Corinth Secondary School at age 13. The principal had write a paper to transfer me to another school. But, you know, at that time I was giving problems at home already. 
But my father said they're making no sense to send me back to school. How old were you? I was 13. 13? Yeah. Your father decided not to send you back to school. Yeah. Yeah. Did you graduate from there? From? Marijuana. Marijuana, yes. What did you do? Crack cooking. At what age? Crack cooking at 15. Tell me about that very first time. Well, it might sound funny to you, but like Superman, I was feeling like I took the first eye from crack. I was feeling like I could have done anything I wanted to do. Tell me about your first arrest. My first arrest, I can't remember my first arrest. Huh? I have so many. I can't remember my first arrest. But I could remember, you know, the first time I got locked up. I got locked up, that was the boys' training centre. Uh, for housebreaking, I got three years. What location was the house and how were you able to enter? It was my neighbor's home. My neighbor's home, I took off the louvers and I went in. What did you get? Well, I didn't have time to take anything because he came and met me inside his home. And tell me what happened next. Well, he, he attacked me. Then when he came to knock me, he said no. He told himself no, but he said it aloud. Then he told me, because of your mother, I'm not killing you in my house. And then he, he called my mother, and my mother was at work. He called her at work, and then he brought me to the police station. And then after, I don't know what arrangement they made, I got released. And then about uh, three weeks after, I got rearrested and brought to court, and I was sent to the Boys Training Centre. Tell me what happened on entry, that first time you went to Boys Training Centre. Well, I was already going through problems at home because I raised up an abusive father, you know. As, you know, the, the, the problem, what had really caused me to go astray and smoke is my father, you know, I wasn't feeling loved at home. I was always in fear because he used to beat my mother and he used to beat me a lot too. You know, and when I reached the boys training centre, I seen rules, I never custom of rules at home. You know, and I have to be facing rules. I didn't stay there long. I always running away, running away. I was not stable there. Uh, from there, I got transferred to a majesty prison. A majesty prison. Yeah. At what age? 15. You went to a majesty at 15? Yes. That certainly isn't the norm. Yeah, I was almost 16. I think I was missing about two months to be 16. First experience, first walking into a majesty's prison, what was that like? Fear. I was afraid because I used to hear all kinds of stories about there, you know, guys raping guys and stuff like that. I was afraid. And the officers, they say I'm too small to put in the main yard among everybody else, so they put, they locked me up in the corner. Then that's where they had guys that were sentenced to hang, but it's an isolated place. Juveniles in St. Lucia are referred to as individuals below the age of 16, contrary to international law, which sets the limit at 18 years. Prisoners between the age of 18 and 25 make up more than 30% of Baudelaire's population. When assessing the lifetime impact of a criminal record and imprisonment of these youngsters, it is important to give an account of stigmatization and the emotional and physical trauma experienced in jail. I wouldn't say I was raped, but you know, through fear and through I was young and stupid, you know, I ended up in homosexual activity while I was there. Well, I was placed in a cell, you know. Well, I, I did the first portion of my four months, I did it in the condom, and then they needed the space, so they transferred me to another cell upstairs. And then whilst I'm in the cell, every day the fellas I among, I hear them talking about violence, talking about chopping. And I used to see them take beating other guys because there was a gun. And then at night, one of the guys roll a marijuana and he come and smoke it with me. And whilst I smoking it with him, he just start touching me up. So I tell him what he doing, stop. And he wasn't stopping, he tell me just cool out. And he just... HMB had a lot of corruption. They had fellas selling weed, they had cutlasses, cooking, rum, name it. The only thing you couldn't get there was women, and the fellas used to use young boys as women. Now, 
the officers, I won't call names, but some officers used to have guys selling drugs for them. And then when young boys come in jail, they used to put them, give the guys that selling drugs for them, as well as the big jail, the young boys as a woman. You were released at age 16? Yes. What did you do after? How did you go back into society? Well, at that time, my father was still around. Yeah, my father was still around at that time. I went back home. My mother accepted me. And then, you know, just to the always beating my mother, my father always beating my mother, you know, and I see like right there, I afraid of it. I could do nothing to help my mother. I just left home. And I end up on the streets. I end up climbing in Cornway, sleeping in shacks, you know. And then I was introduced to yeah, I, was, I was introduced to crack before that, but I wasn't addicted. I didn't have the addictive, the addictive personality in me yet, you know. I used to smoke black joints. And then when I left prison for my first time, I started the free basin. I was smoking on a pipe, straight on a pipe. Yeah. And that's the devil. Yeah, that's the dragon that is trying. How did you get the money to buy it? Stealing. Uh, stealing, breaking houses, robbing people on the side of the road. Okay. Let's talk about some of these break-ins, okay? Yeah. Did you have a normal ammo to get into the people's homes or depending on what house? Did you to, choose, to, did you pay certain houses or? To, to tell you the truth, you know, you might find it baffling, eh? But I do consider myself a thief, you know, it's just when I under the influence of drugs and the cravings to get more, you know, I just walk around, knock on somebody's house. If nobody do answer, I'll just break the door or close a window or take out the easiest way in. When we return, I broke into the bank of St. Lucia once. Every once in a while, a company will appear on the scene with a fresh perspective, a burst of adrenaline, and a passion for excellence. Its humble beginnings are steeped in social transformation. Last to enter the arena, it changes the status quo and the game will never be the same again. The independent film company appeared on the scene when the commercial sector needed it most. Its metamorphosis blossomed with the production of the most creative television commercials in St. Lucia and they do it all absolutely free. From marketing concepts, surveys and research, to professionally produced ads for social media and television, and the most engaging documentaries in the English-speaking Caribbean. With heavy investments in technology and a focus on building the technical and service capacity of its nimble team, it prides itself on being the little company that could. The Independent Film Company Incorporated, changing yesterday's game, rewriting today's roles, and charting the way for multimedia production here, now and beyond. For 138 years, we've had your back. From home contents to medical, auto to business continuity. GTM Insurance. Sound, solid and reliable. Where most people see a window, we see a vision. We see the hours of development and testing. From the precision of craftsmen, quality of components, CNC processing to form immaculate all-glass products. The dedication of people who stand behind a product built to last a lifetime. And who knows, maybe after today, every time you look through one, you'll remember everything that went into it. St. Lou means windows, doors and all glass products and customization of modular products to suit your needs. Precision, quality, safety. 
Secure your windows and your world. Call us today at 454-6538. a stone into the glass, glass down, I enter. And whilst I inside, you know, I, that day I was, I was insane. You know, I'd use a lot of drugs, a lot of crack, and, you know, whilst I inside, I seen a touchlight come on, and I seen a shadow of somebody for guns, so I decided to come back out. When I was going back out, the police were out there waiting for me. Uh, you know, they beat me, you know, they brought me to court. And I got sentenced to three years. Was that your second arrest? No. I can't remember what arrest was it. There was so many, so many arrests. I can't remember which one. As his criminal record became more extensive, Mervyn admits that he accepted his place on the social ladder of the penal system. The only thing I didn't like was the violence, a kind of way, because I had protection. They had those that didn't have because the faggot fellas that was in my case, they used to protect me, you know? Yeah, she was a playground for me at that time. Them time, uh, TV in cell, hot plate, big tape, you know, smoking. Yeah, she was a, was a playground for me at that time. Apart from stealing, what other crimes did you go to jail for? Mm, little fights. You know, ghetto fights with the same crack addicts like myself. You know, you could wound them. Were you in a gang outside prison? No, I was never in a gang. Past 20, where did you live? On the streets. Little ghettos, shacks, different ghettos. You know. Your brothers and sisters, did they come for you? Yeah, well, they tried to help me, I wouldn't lie. You know, my mom. My sister is younger than me, so she couldn't help me at that time. My brother is a police officer, you know. He used to talk to me when he meet me. My mother tried to help me. They bring me, I went to rehab three times before. But the thing is that I, that time I wasn't, I didn't admit I had a problem, you know. I was just saying, boy, I could do my thing and control myself. I was rebellious a lot at that time. The third time you went to rehab, tell me about that. For the time, they didn't want to accept me the full time I went back because the two previous occasions I just walked out, you know, I get angry and I just walk out. I say, my people paying $50 a day for me to be there and I have to be facing this kind of rules and regulations and frustration, you know. When I get vexed, I just walk out. Tell me how that third experience was for you. Well, it was just, I just wanted to please my family, I wouldn't lie. I just wanted to please my family. I didn't, I didn't consider I had a problem at the time, you know. Yeah. Have you ever broken into a house where the people were sleeping? Yes, that's, and that's, that's the only occasion, the time I'd win you now. Tell me about that incident. Well, I left prison. I had about two weeks since I left Bodley. I went to the place I was you know, sleeping, I wouldn't say leaving, the place I was sleeping, that's on the cemetery of Washo. I went there, my friends gave me a crack to smoke. I smoked. You know, I, first couple of days after leaving, I cool out, you know, I'm out taxiing different pusher man, 
I used to deal with steel things. So. And then at night, I went and checked a, a pusher man I used to deal with. And then he tell me, well, my bill high already. I have to try and do something. But he still give me smoke. And when I smoke, I just started walking with intention to steal something. I walked from Ben Adil to Sunny Acres. You guess how fr friendship in before you take the mall. And I went to the, um, the master suite. I, that's where the owner stays. And I forced the sliding door to enter. But it wasn't in my mind if she there or if she not there. My mind was just get something, get something for me to smoke. That is all that was in my mind. And then the glass exploded. And when I was forcing it, it burst. I get some cuts in my foot. And so much blood, I see blood spraying. You know, the, the intention to take something left me, and I just left. Tell me about the trial. Well, in the High Court, the judge, when they asked me, what's my plea? The judge tell me, if I plead not guilty and they find me guilty, I will get maximum. If I plead guilty now, he will give me a minimum. And I just feel because I was tired, I was tired of the life, tired of the cooking, tired of jail, tired of, you know, I was just tired. So I, I tell him I had a drug problem, I pleaded guilty, you know, and he gave me seven years. And he ordered for me to go rehab while I was there. You know. Have you been going to rehab? No. I was brought once to do paperwork. They asked me a couple questions, and I was about two months ago, and nothing. Do you think they'd want to accept you now, considering that you've tried rehab three well, times before, and three times before you failed? Well, I have a message for anybody who seems to take life for granted. You see, the thing about all the time you see you're fooling around and you're living your life and you don't care if nobody, people trying to help you and you're not considering it, is when you really need the help. That is when people give up and people turn their back, you know? Well, with rehab, the truth, I don't think they really will accept, they really want to accept me, you know, because I've been there three times before, and the same thing, I just walking out, you know. What's going to be the different this time around? Well, this time around is my mindset, as I know I have a problem now and I want to change. I'm tired, I'm tired of my life. You know? I mean, I cannot even count my convictions, I to show you. I cannot even call my convictions. It's not now I want to change. But you see the thing with society, St. Lucia society, when people know me, people know you as a crack addict, you know, support your, your habit with crime, you know, and always seeing you on the streets and know it's crime. You know, nobody don't want to give you work. You know, nobody don't want to give you a chance. You just get that is the thing. Because I wanted to change. After a while, when I check my life, I see my life going down the drain. I watching. Fellas I went to school with, I seen who have the house, who have the nice car, you know? And I seen I want these things too. And, then I, and, I, and they get it the honest way. So I seen if they get it the honest way, I could do it too. But the thing is that when I go and look for work everywhere I go, they ask me for police record, you know, and things like that. And I know I don't have a good record. Until I just give up and say, well, because in the ghetto, fellas not giving you nothing. The only thing they'll give you is drugs, to get you teased, to go back and do crime so you could bring something for them, you know? So I just had to just go back to the crime. It was like a no choice scenario for me. You know, when I go back and check my mother, she telling me she not giving me money because that could make me go and smoke, you know, and them kind of way. She don't want me to go and smoke with her money. She would give me food and stuff, but I need, I mean, I need things, you know? So I used to just go and do crime. And I cannot do crime without a high. To tell you the truth, I was I here, you know, this time around. I just have little reflections when I lie down on my bed. And, and I just think about I say, how that lady had feel when I break her house and the lady probably, because I get to know she was inside there after, you know. The fear she probably was feeling, she alone in there, you know, and somebody big, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, she just say a glass break, you know. I seen I could have killed that lady by heart attack, although I'm not too much of a violent fella, you know, but just the fear, you know, I put myself in her shoes, you know, and I really ask God to forgive me because, you know, it could affect her psychologically too, you know, 
she could always be living in fear just because of that experience. When I go on them crime, I doesn't think. The only thing that has been in my mind is crack, crack, and jumpy girls, you know, <laughs> girls that you seem to. Yeah. Tell me about those girls. Hmm. How would you get them? Well, they're there, they're there in the ghetto. Then you have money, you know, twenty dollars, or you have drugs, you smoke, you give them a little change to put in the pocket. They'll have sex with you. The rate of recidivism in St. Lucia is caused as much by inconsistencies in sentencing procedures in the magistrate's court as it is by drug addicts in St. Lucia. 42% of prisoners are serving sentences of two years and below. 24% are serving less than one year. Imprisonment is overused in St. Lucia and contributes to the 46% rate of recidivism. The management of the bodily correctional facility subscribes to the theory that drug abuse should be seen as a healthcare condition and, as such, drug users should be treated in the healthcare system rather than the criminal justice system where possible. 89% of all offenses are drug-related. Without drug detoxification, offenders are doomed to continue the cycle of addiction, crime, and incarceration. The cry therefore goes out to legislators to provide jailers and prisoners with globally accepted rehabilitation services to help break the cycle of drug addiction-based crime. To society, there is a chorus of similar pleas. Watch out, my children. Watch out, my children. It have a fella for Lucifer with a bag of white powder. And he don't want to powder your face, but to bring shame and disgrace to the human race. My name is Gaspar William. I'm 43 years. And I'm going to start speaking from my heart. I love you all people out there. And things I will do in, I won't do it no longer. I just need counseling, I need a strength, I need a help. My sister, I love you with all my heart, my family. I just need a change in my life, counseling, rehab, whatever. But I know it with my heart, I know I can make a change. Christian <laughs> life. When I leave here, I plan to go over the media and ask and beg society for a chance. I, I need a chance, I need a break in my life. You know, I really need it now. Mm -hmm. Will you do rehab? Yes. This time is it because you want to do it? Yes. Because I need it. Who go on and on, the fool has never been told. Who go on and on, the fool has never been told. Who go on and on, the fool has never been told.